Welcome to the workshop. Happy New Year. Happy Christmas. Happy 2025. Happy Friday. Just be happy. Well, anyway, you can obviously see we've now finally revealed our mystery car, which is our nice Ferrari 308 GT4. And obviously the first video we did, which you saw just after Christmas, you know, was just seeing really how awful it is to get it back on the road and whether John was that crazy to buy such a bargain car. I think actually he's done okay. It's not as bad as we think, but we still don't know if the engine runs. And that's what we've been working on on the second video so far. We've kind of reconditioned the fuel system, kind of got it actually so it doesn't leak anymore. And hopefully it's less gummy than it used to be. So it should be nearly ready to go. And then a video coming up in a week or two's time is when we're gonna actually start doing the rest of the service work. So we're gonna do the timing belts. We're gonna do kind of the water pump that was seized, the water system, that kind of stuff. Probably chuck in some spark plugs and actually see if it spins over, give it a compression test, all that kind of exciting stuff. Now behind me, you can see another couple of videos we did slightly earlier on at the end of last year which was our lovely Range Rover chassis. Now, obviously you remember that we actually dipped it in the Evaporus tank and I still love that chemistry and it obviously transformed the inside and the outside. We then dipped it in a big tank of zinc. And so we've now actually galvanized the whole thing. And then just for extra good measure to make it last forever and ever and ever, we thought we'd then powder coat it with a lot of lovely paint. Now, the only thing is there's one more stage before we can start bolting things on. But once we've done that, once we've rebuilt the axle, we've kind of done the brakes and the suspension stuff, we'll then have a nice big roller skate, which we can then obviously push John around the yard in perhaps, but certainly it will feel like the Range Rover is actually coming back to life and maybe we'll finish it by the end of this year. Who knows? But also behind me is perhaps even slower project than that. It's probably the slowest project in the workshop. This is our boat. You may remember from about two years ago or so, we started playing around with this. And when you last saw it, it would have had kind of wooden decks. Actually, the whole thing is pretty much composite with bits of wood in annoying places. And of course, because wood is susceptible being a natural product, obviously when the sun kind of gets onto the lacquer, it starts going to make it peel, gets inside, it all gets a bit mouldy and a bit green. So we ripped all of that off. We're going to put it with some synthetic wood over the top and hopefully then it's going to look fantastic. But of course, actually it's the paint that I'm really, really keen to sort out. So on this, I want to go for something very, very hot rod like, probably some metallics or some kind of flip flop or something really, really mad, a candy apple. I don't know, just some really, really interesting paint colors just that you just don't see on the river. And talking about that, because this was originally designed as actually it's a planing hull, it's designed to go out on the open water, definitely lakes, but definitely not really rivers. And obviously on the Thames, you're limited to a speed for one thing, but it also means that when you go through a lot of locks, there's a lot of issues with kind of just kind of keeping control. The prop is all the way back there. And this thing is so difficult to steer when you're not going any speed at all. So at this end, we've just dug a big hole and you can see that's how you're supposed to be there. So we're gonna have a bow thruster. And now you don't really need a bow thruster on a boat this small, but because we're gonna have this lovely paint and we're gonna have no fenders on it at all, the idea is you want to see when you get into a lot of bouncing around, hopefully that's gonna solve that problem and make it a little bit easier to control. If you want to see this on the show, then do let me know. If you don't want to see this, do let me know. All of that in the comments would be really interesting. As you can see, not much has changed over the winter. Right, there well, another thing that we actually teased in the second Ferrari video was the building of our office building, a brand new building inside our existing workshop building. And the reason for that is it's so cold in here, it'd be nice to have a nice warm refuge. Now we're going to build it the same way we did the mezzanine, basically lots of steel structure. And then obviously we're going to put in wood and floorboards and bits and pieces. And then of course, we're gonna actually clad it with things like windows and insulated walls so we can actually heat it up and keep it nice and warm, all nice and cool in the summer should we actually have a warm summer. Now, because it's such a different thing to our normal car stuff, we thought we'd put it out as a separate video. That's gonna be our next one, hopefully next week. And the idea is then that you can actually see the whole build all the way through. And we're actually gonna do some underfloor heating as well. So you can see that it will actually get some warmth. And then we're gonna just do that every once in a while as well, in between Ferraris and of course the Range Rovers. Now, another video that was very popular recently, we went to the Bosch workshop and we actually played around with some contactors or basically a way to save thousands of pounds on an EV repair. And it seems you were quite interested in that. We had loads of comments about the contactor itself and what it would look like inside when it had failed. Well, here is one very similar to the one we actually had on that Nissan Leaf and we can explore exactly what's wrong with it. Now you can see obviously in it's in its kind of normal environment, you'd have all the batteries at this end and a couple either side of that, you'd have the fuse unit just here. And then of course, then you'd have the connector just on the outside of the pack going to the stack, if you like, or where the inverter is in the front of the vehicle. 
Now this is the negative contactor, then you've got the kind of the pre-charged contactor, the little kind of thing just in there, you've got the positive contactor, and then that white thing there is the resistor, and the resistor is designed just to help ease the electrons into the inverter rather than them rushing in and actually arcing all over the place. This thing actually just slows that flow right down, so hopefully you don't get any things or any arcing going on. Now the problem is, even though you've got that kind of protection in that system, it also discharges the system when you turn everything off as well to make it safer quicker, but the problem is, even though you've got that protection, sometimes, for some reason, the contactors can actually kind of get stuck and weld up together. It's just like welding metal of any kind, pretty much, you know, using electric arc. So, of course, that electric arc is so hot, there's so much current that it actually melts the steel involved. And, of course, then that either causes your weld, if you like, or blows a hole, depending on how well it's going for you. And for some reason, in the contactors, the same thing pretty much happens again. So, effectively, that welding welds those contactors together. And that's why the car does a little dance at the beginning. We saw with the telescope we did in the, in the episode where you can see them come on and off and why turning on the positive contactor in this particular case then if it actually sees voltage which it would do then it knows that the negative contactor is actually welded shut obviously if it turned that on there was no voltage then it knows that actually that's where it should be and isn't welded shut so it's quite a clever system so it can kind of protect itself but of course that's what drives the error on the dashboard that we had to fix by changing this whole unit now in the episode we saved thousands of pounds by replacing just this 200 pound part but potentially we could have saved even more money just by replacing the individual contactors because they do seem to be a separate product with a separate part number and they kind of held onto this base plate by these little plastic tags. So there's a couple on the back here. There's another one sort of on the front there. So I think I'm going to try and get that off. And then if we can get even further inside, I'm hoping we can then actually get to see the contactors. It might involve a hammer and chisel or a saw or something, but we will find out exactly what kind of welded contactors look like. So the first thing I want to do is actually just check the continuity to see which contactor isn't working. So I've just turned my multimeter on to continuity, put the little speaker on as well, so you can hear that, that definitely means we've got continuity there. So across the terminals of the first contact to the positive, nothing there, it's good. Aha, but the negative, as you can hear, is actually a dead short, which is obviously what it shouldn't be. So we know that that's definitely the problem. So the next thing we need to do is now try and wrangle this apart somehow. Now it looks like it's held in by this sort of a little bit just there. So I'm just gonna now, it doesn't really matter if I break this, obviously, because we're not gonna need it again. But there's like a bit there. Bit, oh, that one's already broken, brilliant. And then I'm hoping I can kind of just, I hope that's good, lever it off. Aha, okay. So that's the first bit. Now you can see you've actually got some little Torx terminals there, or screws if you like. So this goes to just an earth, which is good, and then that one, I'm going to undo it anyway, I'm not quite sure what it's connected to at this point, but clearly it's going to hold it in place. Uh -huh. Right, so that's actually the metal terminals, kind of, almost like big bus bars really. So now what I'm going to try and do is remove, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, not easy to do without breaking it, but then clearly I'm not being gentle enough. But look at that, that's super easy to get out. So now I've just got that last little connector there to undo, like so. So now we have our contactor, right, so just get that out of the way, and then some of the spare parts. So now this is clearly assembled in the factory. You can see it's got a couple of little sort of tangs that go all the way around. I'm hoping if I push these four in, that top bit might come off. And then what's well, probably some kind of standard-ish relay, also there's the terminals here. I don't know, we'll give it a go. It may start having to get increasingly violent, but we'll see what happens. It's definitely not designed to come apart, I don't think. do that. Let's just make it slightly easier to get in. It's nearly there. <laughs> so I'm now mostly just gouging it out, but I think it's the only way we're going to get in properly. Watch the tea, very important. Talking to which, obviously, the t-shirt is available in the shop. So rush out and buy a couple. Surely we're getting close now. Aha! 
So now, obviously that is our actual contact here. So the bit that we've got a problem with is probably inside here. Now usually, it looks like it's like a ceramic case, it might actually have sort of maybe in a little environment where it's actually sealed, it might have sort of oxygen-free atmosphere in there potentially, um, which obviously helps stop the oxidization, but we may see if we can liberate that. I'm sure it's not terribly poisonous. Now what's interesting, it actually says on the contactor 120 amps and it's about 360 volts, give or take, for the battery pack which would put it at around 43 kilowatts but the motor's 80 kilowatts. So it means that perhaps the capacitors in the inverter are doing quite a lot of work to make sure there's enough current at that end to actually kind of get it all into the motor. But I'm very intrigued by that, so it means that at full power unless my maths is really wrong, so obviously tell me so in the comments, because I know you really want to, but that sounds quite intriguing, that obviously this is only rated, and of course the other side also be the same rated, but of course it's going in a little loop, if you think about it, with the electrons, so I'm very intrigued by that. But I'm sure someone, hopefully someone out there, will have a reason why that works that way. Very intriguing. Anyway, I will try and get this out, hopefully. I think what I might have to do is just tear the plastic, because there's a little... A, because we'd be quite interested to see what else is going on in here. So what I'm expecting to see is a coil. And then this little terminal on the side here is going to operate that coil. Anyway, so just like a normal relay, you can see the coil there. Obviously, once that's energised by the current going through that coil, it's then obviously going to pull down the connectors or push them up whichever way and obviously then join those two together. And at the moment, what's happened is because it's welded in place, it doesn't really matter if you operate that coil because that plate that joins these two terminals is still too connected, if you like. So I'll just spin it around the other way, try and get in this way. But I'm struggling to get any further than that. And this foam. It's like a kind of a, a dense rubber, actually. So what I really want to do is now I now want to get inside this little bit here. And that looks like it's going to be a little bit difficult. So we'll see. I don't know whether the top, the cap, basically it's like a kind of a flash arresting sort of cap. If you think about some of these big fuses that you normally have in either just your normal kind of mains electricity or whatever it is, you have like a kind of almost like this resistor actually. So you have this kind of ceramic kind of casing. So then if the metal explodes, and you know, obviously when it actually blows the fuse, then it actually is going to be contained within that sort of insulating space. And I guess that's exactly what's going on here as well. But as I said, it might also be have like a modified atmosphere in there of some sort, like a bit of nitrogen or whatever. Argon, I don't know. <laughs> we might have to get even more violent. I'll just get a little bit of bit of leverage. Okay. Very handy vice. <laughs> so I'm doing I'm just gonna pop that in there like so. Obviously, I was wearing this earlier, as you could probably see. So now I'm just gonna try and wiggle this off. Because if I can't wiggle it off, I'll have to cut it off. Nope. <laughs> okay, that's a shame. Right, right then, so just reset that. So, all these bits coming off, it's lovely. Definitely won't be putting this back together again. So what I want to try and do now is cut that top bit off. So the, basically the bits that we're trying to get to is inside this white part here and this sort of ceramic can there. And so what I'm gonna have to try and do, I'll try and cut the metal at the bottom. Let's give it a go with one of those. <laughs> Okay, so you can now see the little plastic bit, so that's operating, so inside there is a little pin, so you can see the pin is what's going to be probably pushing it in position. So now what I want to do, I'll just take that out, put that in there like so, we're getting closer, I like that. Let's just try and lift that out, there's a little plastic carrier here, and so that's actually interesting. So the carrier seems to be sort of around either side of the copper bit which is doing the joining, I suspect it's kind of hooked over, which is why it's not actually wanting to come off so easily. And there's a little spring 
in between the two, so you can see it's kind of bouncy. I will just use a bit more brute force to try and remove that. Sounds so horrible. There's our little spring. <laughs> Oh, there we go, managed to get it off. So I've now broken that weld. So now you can see inside there, if I put it around the other way, it's very difficult to see on the camera, but I can hold both bits perhaps. You can see there that we've got the pitting on both the little bit that moves, and of course the terminals that you're connecting your battery cables to. There's actually not a lot of metal. When you look at how thin that is, I'm running 120 amps through it. So it probably can handle a lot more than that, I would have thought, but still not a lot of metal. <laughs> Online, you do see a few people saying, oh yeah, you can kind of dislodge a welded contact with a bit of a tap of a hammer and a punch, but I think it would take quite a big hammer to make that actually wobble enough to come apart. But it's really interesting understanding what's going on inside. And actually it is just, it's kind of like an oversized relay. So it really is as simple as that. But obviously this particular episode of not so rapid deconstruction, obviously it comes to an end here. But remember next episode, we're gonna be actually constructing an entire building in our building, which should be very exciting. So watch that. And then a couple of weeks later, there'll be our Ferrari back to that and we're gonna finish the servicing. So see you next time.